Good morning, Grace Church. Join me as we pray together. Our Father, being together today reminds us that no one ever cared for us like Jesus. So, Father, we acknowledge this great gift of yours to us. You sent your Son, Father, while we were yet sinners to hang on a cross in our place for forgiveness of our sin and a way to back to you. So, Lord, we stand in that truth this morning that we are children of yours. You have your arms around us. You have our eternal best interest in mind. So, Lord, help us to trust you more fully in the intricacies of our life the stuff we grapple with internally, when we're on the job, when we're in the community, when we're in our families, Lord. We yet acknowledge that this life is difficult, that there's still war and rumors of war, not just physically, but in our heart, as we struggle to trust you. So, Father, we look forward to what you're going to do in and through us this morning as you draw us closer to yourself. May your Holy Spirit continue to minister to to this body of Christ. Minister to those that are discouraged, those that have experienced loss, those that are grappling with depression and anxiety. We also mourn with those who mourn. We are happy with those that are happy. But, Lord, we're thankful that our our relationship is not dependent upon our feelings. We humbly ask, Father, that you would continue to move in our midst, drawing us to yourself. We're thankful for what you're doing around the world also. And we, we lift up especially the Julians right now who are working in Spain as faithful missionaries. We pray, Lord, that you would give them wisdom as they raise their family in a, another culture, that you would give them wisdom as they guide other missionaries, that you would continue to connect them and build trust with those who don't yet know you. We also think of the youth group, Lord, as they travel to Boston. We pray for a safety, but no fear, and a fear of you only, that you would guide these young people to have a worldview that reflects you as they do acts of mercy that those who were ministered to would know that these are motivated by Christ. So, Lord, grow them this week. Give wisdom to Kevin and his team as he guides this crew. We also ask humbly, Father, that you would speak through your servant this morning, Pastor Mike. We're thankful, Lord, that your word is true and your word will meet us exactly where we need to be met by your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, this morning, draw us closer to yourself. Be glorified. Be seen for who you really are. Help us to trust that as we walk in your design, you will meet all of our needs. And then we humbly ask, Father, that you would make us just a little bit more like Jesus because of our time together. And we pray in his name. Amen. So join me as we read from the scripture, James chapter 1, verses 13 through 18. I'm reading from the NIV, the small print edition. So (laughs) if you could follow along with that. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. I told you, Steve, that 
when Lifely still had a Christian bookstore here in Lancaster County, I went there to buy a New Living Translation, and I got home and I said to Jenny, this is really cool, I, I can really read this well. And she looked at the front and she said, well, it's a large print edition. And I said, <laughs> oh my goodness, and I took it back because I wasn't gonna be that old that soon. So <laughs> you might need one of those. Not I, just larger glasses. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, if you were with us last week, you know that I got some inspiration for the sermon last week from my, daughter, my granddaughter's um, board book entitled, We're Going on a Bear Hunt. And uh, it seemed to resonate with an awful lot of people. In fact, I have a notion to call Amazon and see if there was a significant increase in the purchase of this board book from Lancaster area addresses because I want a cut of whatever they made out of that sale of this board book. You might remember that the sermon was about trials and that what we learned from this board book is, maybe you even remember it well enough to say it with me, you can't go over it, you can't go under it. What do you got to do? You got to go, boy, you really do remember. That just makes me so happy. You've got to go through it. And that is almost always true, almost. There is one category of life's trials that frankly, every one of us should go out of our way to avoid. We should run as far and as fast as possible from those trials. It is that category of trials called our temptations, the temptations to sin. You know that the temptation to sin is actually a trial of life. It's an inward trial of life that we all face and quite often in our daily lives. The outward trials of life we learned about last week are trials over which largely we have little or no control. Trials like physical illness, grief over the loss of someone that we love dearly or something that was precious to us, family brokenness, financial troubles. What we need to understand and know this morning, however, is that our outward trials more often than not bring with them temptations to sin. Do you realize that? Do you realize that the devil wants to twist your trials in life so that you dishonor God in the way in which you respond to those trials? For example, chronic illness or the grief of losing someone can sometimes tempt someone to lose faith or even walk away from their relationship with Jesus for a time, maybe become bitter, maybe even become addicted. Financial troubles, we've seen this in the front page of the paper, have tempted people to cheat, lie, and steal because they need money. And then brokenness in marriage has too often tempted husbands and wives to look elsewhere and to be unfaithful to their husband or wife. Persecution for one's Christian faith or even just negative pressure from others because you are a Christian has led some people to actually walk away from their faith or to renounce Jesus Christ. This is why Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Say this with me. Resist him. Say it again. Resist him. And look at what James says in James chapter 4, verse 7. He says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. When the inward trials of temptation come calling, do not attempt to go through them. Don't try to go over them. Don't try to go under them. Do not try to go through them. Run as far and as fast as you can away from the inward trials of temptation. Now, to drive that point home, James carefully and skillfully teaches us in verses 13 through 18 of chapter 1 how temptation works and where it leads and also why we don't need to go there. So, Let's begin this morning with how temptation works and where it leads. The very first point that James makes in this section, in verse 13, is that temptation does not come from God. This is James' emphatic point in verse 13. Look at what it says. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Now listen, the very nature of God is that he is a good God. 
He is not an evil God. Therefore, he will never tempt you to do anything that is evil, anything that is sinful. He is never to blame when we fall prey to temptation and when we sin. Yet, it's interesting to me how people blame God for the mess that they get themselves into. And where did that all begin? Well, it began with Adam in Genesis chapter 3. You might remember the story, how Adam and Eve ate from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, doing directly opposite of what God told them to do. And so as a result, sin entered the world. God then showed up in the cool of the day. He confronted Adam and Eve regarding their sin. And what is interesting is how Adam responded to God in Genesis chapter 3, verse 12. To defend himself, he said to God, it was the woman, now get this, you gave me. It was the woman you gave me. Imagine this, standing before the God of the universe, why did you sin? Well, it was the woman you gave me. In other words, had you not given Eve to me, I wouldn't have sinned. Had you not placed her in my life, I would not have done this. So ultimately, God, you are to blame for my sin. God may use trials in our lives to test our faith, and we know he does. Last week, we talked about how he uses physical illness and grief and troubles and trials to test our faith so that our faith is made pure and strong. But God never tempts us to sin. He never in our trials dangles temptation or sin in front of us. So where does temptation come from? Temptation comes from us, from within us. Listen, James 1.14, each one is tempted when by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. This week when I was studying, I came upon Proverbs chapter 19, verse 3. And it was so powerful, I wove it right into this sermon. Look at what the Word of God says. People ruin their lives by their own foolishness and then are angry at the Lord. Years ago when I was pastoring in Baltimore, I was a a one-pastor shop, so to speak. And so as the only pastor, I had to do it all because there was no one else to say, oh, can you take this, can you take that? So I did a lot of financial counseling in those years as a pastor in Baltimore. And I remember this one couple that was just really struggling under a heavy load of credit card debt. And I was meeting with them weekly and finding resources to help them and trying to get them onto a budget and trying to help them restrain their temptation to spend money. And I said to them early on, listen, you cannot purchase anything big. Well, we want to buy a house. I said, you are a long way from buying a house. And so we're working together for about six months. And they came in one day and they said, guess what? And I said, what? And I'm thinking, you know, like they paid down one of their credit cards. They said, we bought a house. I said, you, you, you bought what? They said a house. You mean like on the Monopoly board, one of those little greenhouses? No, we bought a house. I said, oh my goodness. Oh, it will be fine, Pastor Mike. We know how to manage our money. It will be fine. Six months later, they came in and they said, we are in big trouble. We can't make the mortgage and we can't pay all of these other bills that we have Pastor Mike, why would God allow us to buy that house? And I said, he didn't. Yes, he did. We prayed and, and we told him that if he wanted us to have that house, he'll let our contract go through. And that's what he did. And he did that. I said, God is not to blame for you buying that house. Listen, people ruin their lives by their own foolishness. And then they are angry at the Lord. Now, I want you to notice this morning that James doesn't even give us an out in this passage for blaming anyone, not even the devil. James lays the responsibility for temptation and sin squarely on our doorstep. Now, my mother used to teach me, and this was 
a method of trying to break a bad habit. She used to say, when you point the finger of blame at someone, guess what? Did, did your mother ever teach you this? You have three fingers pointing back at you. And that is very true. Now, to describe how temptation comes from within us, James does something very helpful. He dissects temptation for us in verses 14 to 15. I love how one Bible scholar says that in verses 14 to 15, he puts temptation into slow motion. So I put it on the screen for you so you can follow it and you can understand how temptation works and where it leads. Deception leads to desire, which leads to disobedience, which leads to death. Let's take that apart. Deception is at the root of temptation. Now listen, temptation gets us when we can't think or see clearly. Maybe you've known someone who, when they have sinned or when they've been caught in sin, has responded with a simple phrase, I don't know what I was thinking. I don't know what came over me. I don't know why I would have done what I did. Well, we say that because frankly, we're not thinking clearly, we're not seeing clearly when we fall prey to temptation. After Adam blamed God and Eve for his sin, do you remember what Eve said to God? The serpent deceived me, deception, and I ate. This is why every one of us need to be alert when we find ourselves in the outward trials of life. Hear me when I say this. When the outward trials of life come, when we're in the midst of physical illness or someone we dearly love is battling physical illness, when we're walking through significant grief, when we're, when we're in the midst of family brokenness or financial troubles, we are prime targets for temptation. And the reason is because we are physically, emotionally, and spiritually tired. And so we become prime targets in the midst of our sheer exhaustion, physical, emotional, and spiritual. And so what deceives us then are, second D, the desires that rear their ugly head in our lives. So moving from deception to the second D, desire, desire opens the door then to temptation. Every one of us has evil desires that are hidden deep in our minds and our hearts and sometimes not even that deep. Those desires are part of our sinful nature. So I want you to listen very closely to what I'm about to say. If you are sitting here today and you are a Christian, you have been born again by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And the moment that you receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of your life, in the throne room of heaven, God declared you righteous and he forgave you of your sin because of what Jesus accomplished for you on the cross. Then he sent his Holy Spirit to take up residence in your life. And the Spirit of God, simultaneous to declaring you righteous and forgiven, the Holy Spirit of God transformed you from the inside out, took up residence in you, gave you the assurance that you're now a child of God, and that someday you will live forever with Jesus Christ in heaven. So you as a Christian sitting here today have the Holy Spirit of God living within you. But hear me when I say this. You are not perfect, and I am not perfect. We still have our sinful nature, and that sinful nature resides with us along with the Holy Spirit until the day we go to heaven when once and for all that sinful nature is crucified and removed from us, and we are made absolutely perfect. So we live with a battle going on inside of us between what the Holy Spirit is telling us to do and what our sinful nature is telling us to do. Perfect example of that happened on Monday as I was going out and doing some errands. So uh, we have an all-staff meeting every month on the first Monday of the month. And if we don't have lunch arranged, we always have a dessert and we celebrate the people's birthday for that month. I knew that we didn't have a dessert. I thought we didn't have a dessert. So I texted Brandy, our church administrator, on Sunday night, and I said, hey, don't we have a dessert? No, we don't have a dessert. I said, I'll swing by Byler's Donuts, and I'll bring Byler's Donuts in for a dessert. Now, 
I, anywhere I am in the world, I can swing by Bylers. So it was not a problem, no issue at all. I swung by Bylers. So I said, you know, how many donuts we need? She said, two dozen donuts. So I was like, okay, here we go. So I get there, you know, early, about 7.30, and I go in there, and I'm going to order these donuts. Nobody else is there, but this man follows me in. So I start down, you know, the case. I think there are 38 donuts, 38 varieties, not that I counted, and I need a 24. So I start to name what I need, and the guy behind me says, whoa, my goodness, big spender today, aren't you? And I didn't, you know, say anything. I just sort of smiled, and he said, uh, man, you're ordering a lot of donuts. So when I got to the second dozen, he said, you're going to be the favorite in the office today. I can tell you that. Everybody's going to be grateful that you were here this morning buying donuts. And I'm thinking, okay, fine. I just want to buy my donuts. So I get to the end of my two dozen. Now, this is what I always do. I, I buy donuts for the office. And then I always say, now I want one more in a bag. And I guess you get to guess who that's for. <clears throat> but... Uh, I said, and then I want uh, a Boston cream in a bag. And the guy behind me says, huh, I know what you're up to. You want them to think you didn't have a donut on the way in. So you buy your donut separately and eat it separately. And like I'm standing there thinking, who are you? And who put you in my life this morning? For goodness sakes. And it really does work very nicely. Nobody has any idea until today. And if it doesn't have cream in, I have it done by St. Joseph's Church. If it has cream, it takes me to Hazel Street, but I'm done with my donut. That's just something you didn't need to know, but it's the truth. And then he says, this is just the lead up to the story. Then he says, and I can't believe this, he says, yeah, he said, you know, my wife told me not to stop for a donut today. I said, oh, well, here you are. He said, yeah. He said, I got two roommates who are telling me two different things. And I thought, I really don't need to hear this. And uh, he said, yeah, I got one roommate telling me, eat a donut. And I got another roommate telling me, don't eat a donut. And I said, two roommates. He said, yeah, two roommates. They're, they're up here in my head. And the one tells me when I walk by here, stop and eat a donut. And the other tells me, no, go past it and don't eat a donut. And I'm standing there thinking, okay, Jesus, this relates to what I'm going to preach about. Thank you very much. I don't know if he was a Christian. I don't know if he ever read Galatians chapter 5. I don't know that he knows the theology, but I want you to notice what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 5. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. Make no mistake, your sinful nature and its desires are dangerous. And what James next does is he uses the language of hunting and fishing to highlight that truth. In these verses, he talks about how we are dragged away and enticed by our sinful desires. The phrase dragged away is a hunting term, and it refers to that moment when a predator pounces on his prey and drags it away for dead. The word enticed is a fishing term, and it can also be translated lord, and it refers to the lure that the fisherman puts onto his line to hide the hook so as to entice the fish to bite so that it then gets hooked and can be reeled in for the win. And this is what God tells us through James. We are easily deceived by the sinful desires of our life. And if we're not careful, if we're not alert, if we are not aware, we will be dragged away and enticed by those sinful desires. And when they drag us away and entice us, they lead us to the third D. And the third D is disobedience or sin. James says in verse 15, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. Sin happens, friends, when we give in to temptation. Everybody here who's a Christian sins. 
Everybody here who's a Christian will fall prey to temptation. You will give in to it. You cannot punish yourself every time that happens because what you should be doing with the energy you use to punish yourself is confessing your sin because here's what the promise of God is in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we fall prey to temptation, we need to confess it to the Lord and ask him to forgive us and move on. You know what we often do? We allow that sin to accumulate, sin over sin over sin over sin. We do not confess it, we do not repent. James writes, and sin when it is full grown gives birth to the fourth D, which is death. Ominous sounding, isn't it? Full grown sin means sin that remains unconfessed in your life. Death is not a reference to physical death necessarily. It can be. But the death that James is talking about is far more sobering. Giving into temptation, doing it repeatedly so that we establish a pattern of sin in our lives will have a deadly impact in our life even as we live our life. I, I really, you know, was determined to illustrate this in three different ways. And, and finally yesterday I said, okay, Jesus, I know, I know what you want and I've been pushing against it. I wanted to give the illustration of the deadly impact of adultery, the deadly impact of gambling, the deadly impact of hate. And there was just this one thing that Jesus kept impressing on me for this sermon. What about the deadly impact of unforgiveness? The, the, the sin that we let slide, because after all, it's not a biggie. You know, when we, when we grade sin and we, we give adultery and gambling the numbers that are high in the double digits, we kind of take unforgiveness and we kind of put it in the single digits and let it be hidden. Let me tell you something. When someone insults you, hurts you, offends you in any way, you've got a choice. You forgive them or you don't. If by the power of the Holy Spirit you forgive, you experience freedom. If you don't forgive, you experience bondage that is deadly. It's deadly to you. Funny thing about unforgiveness. Well, I'm not going to forgive her. I will never forgive her. Let's just see how she likes that. Let me tell you something about her. She's just having a great time in her life. She's just going to the beach, you know, two weeks, three weeks in the summer, has a couple weekends away in the fall, and you're just like, Mwah. she is completely oblivious. But you are completely, completely in bondage. It is deadly to relationships. It is deadly to your personality to your character. You become, when you don't forgive, you become that person in the grocery store aisle that when someone turns the corner to go get their Wheaties, they see you in the middle of the aisle and they say, uh, yeah, I think I'll go for pickles first. And they go two aisles down just to avoid you because unforgiveness has made you one of the most miserable men and women in the community. And you can't get three minutes into a conversation without bringing up what he did to me. Unforgiveness has a deadly impact on our legacies as well. I've been in ministry long enough to have experienced this where I'll be talking to like young adults in a family and I'll say, yeah, you know, I know such and such part of your family. Oh, we don't talk to that side of the family. Really? Why not? Well, my dad and his cousin had it out years ago, and ever since that, we don't talk to that side of the family. Now, now we're in the second generation. They know why, and they're following the first generation. They're, they're going to be 
unforgiving too. What's really sad though is when I talk with grandchildren and they'll say to me, yeah, we don't talk to that side of the family. We're not inviting them to the wedding. I'm really not sure why. I just know that we don't talk to them. The deadly impact of unforgiveness through the generations of a family. My name is Mike Sigmund. In 1895, my great-grandfather and his brother had some type of broken argument that caused my great-grandfather, Jacob, to change our family name from Jacob Sickman, S-I-C-K-M-A-N, Sickman's Mill, to Jacob Sigman, so as to distinguish us as different from that side of the family. Thanks be to God that they made up, forgave each other, and when they died, they were friends. I said to my grandfather one time, what was that argument about? And he looked at me and he said, you don't need to know. It will die with me. And it did. Thanks be to God. There was no need. And today, we talk to that side of the family. They have a cottage on the circle, can't mean we're just up off the circle. And there's no issue whatsoever. The ultimate destination of temptation is a hard heart. You give in enough, you sin enough, and you will be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Which is why in verse 16, James writes, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Don't be deceived by temptation. Now, this is how temptation works. This is where it leads. Now, here's the good news. You don't have to go there. Amen? Amen. Now, about 30 of you believe that. You don't have to go there. Amen? Amen? That's right. You don't. You don't need to be deceived. James gives us two reasons why we don't need to be deceived. First of all, because of what God has done for us, which is what we've just studied. I'm reading, studying, and preparing this message. I'm saying, Lord, okay, okay, Lord, help me know how to apply this. And, and all of a sudden it occurs to me, oh my word, I don't need to be deceived. I don't need to give in temptation because God graciously used his word to tell me how temptation works so that my eyes are wide open. I have the knowledge I need. I am without excuse. I can never say, well, I didn't know because I know exactly how it works. It starts with deception, it goes to desire, it heads into disobedience, and it ends with death. And so God is gracious. He tells us what he's gonna do, and he tells us what it does to us. Now, from that, I've learned over the years, actually, even before I figured that out, that when I have a trial in my life, an outward trial, or when somebody I know goes through an outward trial, and because I'm a pastor, I know a whole lot of people going through outward trials. I know what happens. When I have a trial, you know the first thing I do? I pray about my trial, okay? You know the second thing I do? I ask others to pray about my trial. But here's something that few of us pray about. And that is that God will put a hedge of protection around us as we go through our trials so that we will not fall prey to temptation in our trials. So when you go through a trial and you say, oh, would you pray for me? Pray that I'll be delivered. Pray that I'll be healed. Wonderful prayer requests. Absolutely valid. But also pray that God will protect me from being reeled in by temptation, temptation to give up on God, temptation to become angry, temptation to become bitter. Pray a hedge of protection around you. Now, the second reason you don't need to be deceived is not just because of what God has done, but it's also because of who God is. 
James, as he rounds out this passage of Scripture in verses 17 through 18, seems to introduce new and unrelated information, and it actually is not new and it is not unrelated. Because what he does for us in verses 17 through 18 is he graciously reminds us in the midst of our temptations, when it's hot, when it's heavy, when you're overwhelmed, he graciously reminds us who he is. First of all, he reminds us that God is good. He is not a tempter. He doesn't have an evil streak in him. There is not an evil bone in God's body. This is what he writes, verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. That simply means that God wants only what is good for you. And he will never tempt you. He will never deceive you. He wants only what is good for you. And I know some of you are sitting there saying, well, if he only wants good for me, man, what is this? But do you remember when you were growing up and, and your parents had to discipline you? Do you remember that they would say, this hurts me? A lot of you were bad, I'll tell you what. <laughs> you, you knew exactly where I was going with that, didn't you? Sometimes we go through hard things because they are good things. God is good. Secondly, God is powerful. He is powerful. In, in this verse, uh, James refers to him as the father of heavenly lights. And nowhere else in the Bible is God referred to as the father of heavenly lights. What does that mean? Well, he's referring to the fourth day of creation when God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. And this is what James is essentially saying to us. Listen, who is powerful enough to create the sun, moon, and stars? God alone, amen? amen? Who is powerful enough to deliver you from temptation and help you resist it? God alone, amen? amen. If he can create the heavenly lights, then he can guard your heart against temptation. God is good, God is powerful. Thirdly, God is faithful. James says that he does not change like shifting shadows, the interplay of light and the clouds. He is not here for the moment, gone in 10 minutes. Here's your theological lesson for the day. He is immutable, which means he never changes. He is always good. He is always powerful. He is always faithful. I love how the writer to the Hebrews says it in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Don't you love it? Read it with me. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He doesn't change. And finally, the God who is good and powerful and faithful is also our Savior. Look at the last verse, verse 18. God chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. First time you read that verse, you think, oh, good. What does that mean? Let me take it apart for you. The God of the universe chooses through his son, Jesus Christ, and Jesus alone to give you birth, a new birth. It's a birth through the word of truth. You know what the word of truth is? The gospel of Jesus Christ. When you trust Jesus, the God of the universe who created the sun, moon, and stars makes you a new creation, giving you a new birth into a new life by the power of his word so that you become a kind of first fruits of creation in other words, you become his child, Margaret, his daughter in the faith because of Jesus Christ. Because of that, because of that, Jeff, you are adopted into his family and your life is transformed, Rob. And, and Randy and Joyce, you are a new creation, a first fruits of creation because Carolyn, he has transformed you from the inside out. And you know why James says this? Because essentially what James is saying, don't you think, 
Don't you think, Andy, that the very God who would transform you from the inside out, forgive your sin, don't you think that the very God who would make you a new creation is ready to hear you when you say, would you help me with this temptation? Because the God who powerfully, Pete, transforms you is also the God who says, I will never leave you or forsake you. And even when you're going through the deepest valley, the deepest valley, Nevin, of temptation, he is your savior and he will deliver you. So I got to the end of my sermon preparation. I said, Lord, is there one word that would summarize this entire sermon? And some of you are sitting there saying, well, that would have made this a quick service had you just started with that one. And I know who you are because I knew who the characters are in this church. I'll get three texts by the end of 1230. Well, why don't you start there? Here's the word. One word. Summarizes the entire sermon. It's a one-syllable word. It's pretty easy to pronounce. It's pretty amazing how it summarizes everything. And, and I found in the past three services, it's a real letdown when I give it to you. So I would like you to ex uh, appear excited when I share it with you, okay? And I'll, make, I'll feel better when we're leaving because it's a powerful word. And it exactly summarizes, I think it summarizes, don't you, Jeff, what I'm about to say. So here's the word. Are you ready for the word? One word. Are you ready? Run! Okay? Now, do you think you can say that with me on the count of three? One, two, three. Run. Wow, you are quick studies. <laughs> run from temptation and run to God. Do not try to go over it. Do not try to go under it. Please do not try to go through it. When temptation comes calling, Run as far and fast as you can from it and run to the God who is good and powerful and faithful and who is your Savior. This is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah and amen. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, I'm just excited about your word because your word, your word is, is, is just evidence of the love that you have for us because what we've just studied lord you gave that to us so that we would not have an excuse to fall prey to temptation you you literally unmasked the evil of temptation and you said this is what you need to look out for and this is what i'll do for you just run lord in this congregation today there are some people who are in the midst of temptation some are being tempted right now, and some have already fallen prey. Lord, I know who you are. You're a gracious and loving God. You don't find fault. And so if they will turn to you, you will immediately give them the power they need to resist temptation. Or if they have given in to temptation, if they confess, you will forgive them and you will deliver them. Lord, I pray that you would do that work in the lives of those who right now are under the stress of temptation. And then for the rest of us, Lord, I pray that you would just tuck this truth away, this instruction in our minds, so that when temptation does come, and it will, we know it will, you would remind us immediately of the truth of your word and the truth of who you are. And we would run to you. And we will thank you and praise you because you are an amazing God. And it's in the strong name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So we're going to stand and sing, and then I'm going to take just a few minutes at the very end of the service. We have a little GCC family business and prayer about one of our church families I want to share with you uh, that is in need of our prayer as of yesterday. So uh, let's stand together and let's worship.